Okay, guys, very welcome back to the show. And I have a very, very special guest on the show today. And this might be his first ever video podcast interview. Uh, WWF, now E, photographer for what? From WrestleMania 1 through to 17. Uh, Tom yeah. Buchanan, thanks so much for the opportunity today. Oh, thanks for inviting me on. Yeah, no problem. So look, we'll rewind back to the start anyway. And how did you become involved going into wrestling photography like obviously that wasn't the plan from what i've researched on you before <laughs> not at all not at all i had no interest in wrestling even a little bit uh, i was a newspaper photographer uh, i worked for steve taylor who was chief photography for world wrestling uh, at the time he was a staff photographer then chief photography for a newspaper in auburn new york i was his staff photographer he was doing a story a photo story about wwf in town this would have been in the very early 80s probably 82 80 three-ish. Uh, they liked his work. They liked the writer, uh, Ed Rasuti, uh, or at that time, uh, Ed Holinsky, and hired both of them sight unseen. A couple years later, Steve Taylor needed help for WrestleMania at Madison Square Garden, the very first one, because I had worked with him before, and he had given me a good recommendation to another newspaper. I owed him a favor, called me up to do the first WrestleMania, and that's how it started. And what was that like going into something like that? Obviously, nobody knew what WrestleMania would become, but were you no. kind of nervous about it? And what, what kind of preparation did you take going into that? So Steve sent me up to Toronto to do one show before WrestleMania, just to get a lay of the land, figure out what a ring is and how to rack focus through all of that, um, how to manage the flash, the lights, the camera, all of that. So I shot one show in Toronto at Maple Leaf Garden, and then to Madison Square Garden. Uh, I grew up in Westchester County, New York, right outside of New York City. So Madison Square Garden was a really important place to, to people like me. It's where the Rangers played. It's where all the big concerts were. So it's just exciting to be there, whether it was for wrestling or anything else, uh, and to be backstage. Uh, WrestleMania was an afternoon show. And that night, there was a Rangers game. So as we finished, they were striking our set and getting the ice opened up for the Rangers. So you see the, all the, the hockey players coming in. Uh, it was a, the, an amazing turnaround. And then we did a, a party at the Rainbow Room at Rockefeller Center, like premier restaurant, amazing place. So for a, a guy from, at that point, Utica, New York, little tiny town, little newspaper, to be in this big environment, it was pretty exciting. And I decided I wanted to keep doing it and told Steve that I'd be happy to keep shooting. Yeah. So that was, was that the deal sealer then originally Madison Square Garden? I can't turn this opportunity down. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And I suppose like, it's not just a matter of going in and taking photos because your roles evolved over the years. Do you want to tell people like how it changed over the years? Sure. So originally I was a freelance photographer. So my job was just to show up at the arena, go to the ring, take the pictures, take my film, stuff it in an envelope and send it off to at that point, Greenwich, Connecticut, and then Stamford, Connecticut. Uh, in time, I was hired as a staff photographer. That happened in 2000, or 1987, uh, November. It would have been after WrestleMania three. So I went on full-time as a staff photographer at that point, primarily as an action shooter, but also some feature shooting on the side, and then grew into a little bit of studio work. And eventually, I was responsible for every image we produced in every application all over the world. So I traveled the world and hired freelancers and set lights and designed the lighting that we would use. So I'd imagine like you've been <clears throat> over here in Ireland probably many times before, yeah? Sure, oh yeah, absolutely. Where was the most fun place you got to go across the world with the WWF? Oh gosh, um, I don't know, fun place is an interesting way to think about it. Uh, mm -hmm. I liked Ireland and Scotland and England because the language is so easy and I could get around so easily. So those were always fun and I always found something else to do while I was there. That was a good time. Uh, some of the weirder places, Kuwait, Middle East would certainly have been weird. Uh, Japan would have been weird. Um, we did a show in Germany soon after the wall fell and we got to go to both sides and feel the difference before the populations kind of merged into one. So that was an interesting time and place to be. Yeah. Uh, so those were some of the fun ones. I always like going to Canada. Uh, I liked what else? Rural areas mostly, I think. Yeah, yeah. Um, what was it like going into a world then 
in the, the late 80s into the early 90s with these larger than life characters is what people see them as on TV. What was your experience of being around these guys? Um, first experience was kind of weird. Uh, Steve sent me up to Toronto for my first ever show. So he set me up with an airplane ticket that I picked up at the airport and flew into Toronto, went to the Howard Johnson's hotel outside the airport. And then I had to get to the arena and Steve's pitch was just ride with a wrestler. They're all staying there, find a wrestler and tell them you're with the show and ride with them. I had no idea who these people were. So I looked for anybody that was big and said, hi, are you a wrestler? Can I get a ride to the arena? <laughs> That's how bad it was at the beginning. And they would have none of that. So I wound up taking a cab to the arena and getting a ride back with Jack Tunney, who was the promoter that night. And then over time, got to know the guys and was able to ride with them and move with them and, yeah. and work with them. Were, th yeah. were they maybe worried about that moment in time because the whole kayfabe was still alive and there's going to be more cameras around and photo shoots. Do you think that was part of the problem? Um, backstage was secretive and certainly some of the older wrestlers were tough in that regard. Uh, Chiche Strongbow, uh, Rene Goulet, they were wrestlers turning into agents and they were very protective. Um, there was a point, I think, for uh, Birmingham or Binghamton, New York, I think, where Rene Goulet was on the card as a wrestler. And I was there as a photographer, as a freelancer. So I was working at ringside. Rene had his show, had his match, went back to get into his agent role and sent somebody to get me, pulled me backstage and said, what the fuck are you and why are you here? I had to tell him that I was working for Steve Taylor and he wasn't happy. Uh, but Steve Taylor's name opened the door and he let me stay and we got along really well after that. Was that maybe because he wasn't supposed to be in a match that night and he was kind of thrown in? Was that the reason why he was so pissed off? No, I don't think so. Um, I think he just didn't know who I was and they were protective okay. of the business. So he sees this photographer that he didn't know about. Why is this guy at ringside and why does he have this credential? Uh, so he hauled me back for that. And he just didn't understand what the, the company was doing, what the business was doing at the time. Yeah. Yeah, I had I had Brian Solomon, who I listened to your show with him on my podcast, I think about a year ago now. <clears throat> and obviously, Brian working with the WWE magazine at one point, and he was telling me like how hands on Vince McMahon was with him, even from Brian to be suggestion, suggesting maybe I think he was going to put the, the top 10 best steel cage matches in, a, in the magazine. And Vince mm -hmm. was like, nope, that's boring. I go with that. Something like that. Uh, yeah. How hands-on was it with you? Um, initially, Linda was even more hands-on. Uh, Linda was the editor, okay. essentially the editor-publisher of the magazine. So when I was hired full-time, uh, Linda was running our production meetings. So okay. we would, she would be running the production meetings. She would have every say about every article, about every picture, about everything. Uh, so she was very, very hands-on. Uh, I remember that first meeting. One of the things she said to me was, Tom, I want you to use my money like it's your money. Treat it with respect. That's the, the control they had at the time. And that was it. So there weren't a lot of accountants. There weren't a lot of rules. There weren't a lot of expense problems. It's just use my money, spend it as you need to, but treat it with respect. And then over time, they grew into a giant corporation. They had to hire accountants, add all of that in and all the controls to protect the money. Yeah. You see, you've seen the whole business evolve, and I've read some articles and bits and pieces that you've interviews that you've done over the years. And you said like the most challenging time for them was during the steroid trial. Can you kind of explain what the atmosphere was like back then during those kind of tough times? It was scary. Um, at the time, we had grown up dramatically, so we were a huge company. Everybody knew Hulk Hogan. We were making money hand over fist. And then we had a steroid trial and we had a little boy sex scandal and we had uh, cocaine issues. So we, it was really hard for us to maintain sponsorships. Uh, some arenas wouldn't have us. The fans were turning away. Business was really, really tough. We had shrunk back down into small sports arenas and yet we still had this huge overhead. Uh, the company was held together with smoke and mirrors at that point. We were near bankruptcy, if not below bankruptcy. We just hadn't gone that route officially yet. So there were massive cutbacks. Um, 
travel was cut, film costs were cut, everything was cut. Our television production was cut. Uh, the quality of the shows goes down. I think you can see that pretty clearly if you watch the old tapes. So it was a tough time. Uh, Vince made it through that trial. Uh, the fans came back. We grew. We became a billion-dollar multinational company, went public. And at this point right now, they're about a $9 billion company. So that's huge. That's growth. But we did it from yeah. negative nothing. Yeah. Did you fear for your job at that time? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, yeah. There was always a concern that we would come to work and the doors would be padlocked, that there just wouldn't be any work anymore. The company would have been taken over. Uh, I had to carry lots of expenses on my credit cards uh, for travel, for hotels, for whatever. And there was always a concern that maybe my expenses won't be paid. I had freelancers that didn't want to work for me if they had to cover expenses because they too were afraid that we would belly up and they'd be left holding the bag. So I wound up putting most of those freelancer expenses on my credit cards, uh, prepaying everything that I could prepay and guaranteeing them that any expenses they incurred would be covered, even if that meant doing it out of my pocket. So that's the only way I could keep freelancers going at that point. Uh, so I had to keep careful track of what my cash advance limits were on credit cards, what my credit limit was on each credit card, so that if the, the company bellied up, I'd have that capacity. Yeah, you must have felt, though, if you were doing things like that, that there was light at the end of the tunnel and they were going to come over. Hoping. Um, I don't know if I believe there was or not. Uh, we were still very, very popular. So even if we weren't successful financially, I think there was a market for wrestling and somehow there would be some reorganization. There was a hope that that would happen. Uh, Linda McMahon had given us a, a good pep speech uh, where she talked about survival and the need for us to pull together, that some of us would lose our jobs, but the survivors would have to pull together and make this thing work because we all cared about the business and cared about the company. And if we did that, we would prosper and we would share in that benefit. So. I think we pushed forward uh, with that as our goal. Yeah. I heard a very interesting, and we'll lighten the mood here now again, story with you on an airplane and a shoe and another shoe involving Vince <laughs> McMahon. <laughs> oh, my Great yeah. story, man. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so it was my first cross-country trip with the company. I'd just been hired as a full-time staff photographer. We were flying from JFK out to Seattle. So it's about a five-hour flight. Um, Vince had a thing, everybody in the company had a thing for stealing shoes if you fell asleep. So that was just a known sort of a thing. So I was sitting backstage. I didn't know about this little thing. So I was sitting back in a, in coach and some person come, came by and dropped a shoe in my lap. It was a black man shoe. I didn't know what this thing was about. And then a short while later, Vince McMahon came up from first class and dropped a white lady's shoe in my lap. Like, I'm perplexed. I have no idea what's going on, but it's weird, and I somehow have to adjust to this weirdness. For some reason, <laughs> I took the black man's shoe and threw it into a lavatory, just left it there so the flight attendants or somebody could get it back to whoever owned it. But I kept the white lady's shoe. No idea why. As the plane comes into land, it's landed, it's taxiing. Flight attendant comes on the PA and asks, if you have lost a black man's shoe, it has been found. If you have found a white women's shoe, it has been lost. The whole plane cracked up, at least all of us cracked up, uh, because everybody knew what the, the rub was. Um, I held on to that shoe. Once we were in the terminal, we saw an Asian woman hobbling around with one white shoe and missing the other, and that was our, our story. Uh, we were doing a Saturday night's main event, or a main event, at the Seattle Arena that night. So I kept the shoe. When Vince came out to do the, his, his announce with Jesse Ventura, I had left it on his chair. He saw it, laughed, pushed it to the side. I picked it up later and carried that shoe with me in a production case for the rest of my time with WWF, just to kind of make it clear that this isn't a normal company. So, yeah, that's the lady's yeah. shoot story. All 17 years. All 17 years. Any place where we took our equipment. So it actually appeared on a carnet into Canada, the customs forms that took us into Canada. <laughs> so so it, it, it probably came out from time to time in the airport then when you were going through places, didn't it? Would it be wonder why does this guy have one shoe? Um, well, it lived in production cases, so it didn't come out in the airport at all. 
right? It was listed on our carnet, on our customs form, as one white woman shoe small or something to that effect. And no customs person ever asked about it. It was just one of those weird things. And you don't ask, I guess. Uh, but it lived with me in the cases. And as I was getting help from stagehands and whatnot backstage to put my lights up, they would see it and would get the story. And then when I left the company, I held on to the shoe and I still have it today. You still have the shoe because I, I've noticed on your social media, like you've got some crazy collectible kind of stuff and you always, you're putting stuff for sale or you're keeping some things, whatever. Is the yep. shoe ever going to be for sale? I don't think so. I don't think anybody would really want the shoe. Um, it's just a keepsake that, that sits on a shelf and reminds me that I had a really weird job at one point. Yeah. Yeah. What's the, what's the weirdest thing that you ever seen working at a wrestling show? There's a question for you. Um, snake shit. <laughs> <laughs> so story about Jake, the snake Roberts, uh, took place in uh, Chicago at the Rosemont horizon, a pay-per-view event. We're supposed to have um, this giant snake for Jake, like huge. Yeah. So the snake person brings it and it's really big. And we don't know that Jake can handle this thing during the show. So we're going to do a dress rehearsal, just walk through and make sure that the snake is going to be okay. So we're in the vomitory, I guess, the back, the, the tunnel that goes to the backstage area pre-show. Jake is pulling the snake out, trying to wrestle with it. The crew is just gathered around in a giant circle as Jake is fighting with the snake and the snake is fighting back and the snake gets scared. And as Jake is spinning around almost in a circle, the snake poops and just blows this pussy yellow green snake shit everywhere across the crew. Hilarious. Um, you missed me. I'm fortunate. Got a lot of <laughs> yeah. So snake shit. That would Any be memories one of the of that? Huh? Yeah. Any any memories of um, Andre the Giant and what he was like? Um, generally pretty nice. Uh, he picked me up by the throat once. Uh, I think it was a match with uh, Ultimate Warrior. He wasn't happy about me being there and photographing this thing. Uh, so he just came over to me and put his hand around my throat. His fingers touched in the back. He lifted me up, did some of his Andre talk, and tossed me down, and that was that. And I didn't take pictures of his matches for a while. And that, that wasn't part of the show. No, that was just him. That was not best. part of the show. That was Andre saying, I don't like you being here. I'm embarrassed by this match. Please don't shoot it. But he said it in an Andre kind oh. of way. Okay. And the, the man you just mentioned there, you hear various different things about him, the ultimate warrior. What was your experience like with him? Um, one of two people that threatened to kill me. So I'm not a fan of, of the ultimate warrior. <laughs> why did he threaten to kill you? Um, story starts in, uh, where were we, uh, bah, 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 West Palm Beach, Florida. Bret Hart was our new champion. He was a really sedate kind of a guy. He didn't, he had charisma, but it was very quiet charisma. Uh, he didn't yeah. interact really well and aggressively with the fans, but we were making him our champion and we really needed him to do that, to be more out there. Uh, so that was the goal. At West Palm, Brett came into the arena for an afternoon show, and I watched him coming in. There were fans everywhere around the backstage entrance. He put his bag down. He waved. He went over and did pictures and autographs and really what we were looking for. So before the show started, I found um, Jim, Jim Myers, uh, George the Animal Steel, who was our agent that night. And told him what I had seen and asked him to please put that in his agent's report so that Vince McMahon would know that Brett was really doing his thing. And Jim said, yeah, but all of our guys do that. They're all interacting with the fans. I said, no, that's not really true. I saw Warrior come in. And when he saw all of this, he put his head down and just marched right through and wasn't supporting the fans, wasn't out there with them. And Jim told that to Warrior that night in the Orlando arena. Yeah. So Warrior got really pissed and was storming through the arena, looking for me, throwing chairs, tipping over tables, he dented a wall. I'm going to kill that Buchanan. Where's that fucking Buchanan? I'm going to fucking kill him. Turns out Warrior had, was probably losing his job at that point anyway. Uh, he had failed a drug test. He was blown out on steroids. This was just one more little piece of that. 
And it turned out to be his last show before leaving. He was fired after that. Uh, Jim found me at the next show or a couple of shows later. He said, Tom, I had to tell Jim what happened. Like I talked to him about not interacting with fans. He asked who told you that? And I had to be honest with him. Uh, so that's how that went down. Uh, never saw him again. That was the end of Ultimate Warrior for me. Yeah, I, I had a guy that you'd know well as well, Tom Fleming, on the show, and he was telling me a story about um, when Papa Shango was debuting and Tom was making his cape and the Ultimate Warrior was backstage and he just kind of walked through them and just kicked the cape for no reason. Yeah, yeah he was an arrogant guy sometimes. Um, I understand he could be nice. I actually never really saw that. Uh, he was pretty pretty full of himself most of the time. And the Roid Rage was a real thing, and that was his real thing. Yeah, yeah. And, like, what was Hogan like then? Was he kind of opposite to what Warrior was? Um, so I didn't interact a lot with Hogan. Uh, he was a super, yeah. super, superstar, and I tried to maintain my distance, my respectful distance there. Uh, in general, he was yeah. good to work with. Um, he was pleasant. Uh, he knew me, and we hung out occasionally, but there wasn't any major interaction like I would have with Warrior. Yeah, yeah. Now, there's another famous story that I think people would like to hear and involves a Burger King in Kuwait. Oh, my. That's an Owen Hart story. Yes. So, Burger King, Kuwait. Um, when we went overseas, well, any place we did a, a show, we had to have a backstage space or an autograph signing. We had to have a backstage space where the talent could be taken care of. It still so, happens to this day. Yeah, yeah, we need a, uh, back then it was a place where they could just relax, uh, and then it grew to a place where they could be safe. Uh, so you needed a safe room after a while. Uh, and Kuwait was a place where we really needed a safe room. So what happens here is we're doing a, an appearance at Burger King, an autograph signing. And those appearances in Kuwait were handled by local promoters, not by WWF people. So I arrived with Owen and Vader, and somebody else who I don't remember, uh, we get to the arena or get to the, the the Burger King and they drop us off at the front. We have a security person with us and that's it. We go inside and they have nothing set up for us at all. There's this huge crowd and no room, no place to wait, no tables for autographs, nothing has been set up. So I had to rip through that really quickly. We had commandeered three tables in the back of the, of the restaurant and just got the talent sitting there really quick, set up a, a deal with the security guy where if we needed it, we would head into the men's room. And there was a window there that we could get out of. Uh, and he made contact with the limos and brought them back. So the limos were coming back. All we had to do was keep the crowd quiet for a little while, make them happy, and then we'd get the hell out of there. So Vader wasn't happy about any of this. Nobody was happy about any of this. Vader especially, though. And he decided he was going to get up and leave the same way he came in. So he got himself up and stormed to the front of the restaurant. There are no limos. There's no place for him to go when he gets there. So I had to chase him down and pull him back through the crowd to the tables, try and calm him down until the limos would arrive. As we're moving through the crowd, the crowd is being pushed in all kinds of different directions. Lots of little kids. There are glass partitions, thick glass frosted partitions between tables, and they're breaking. Pow, pow, sounding like gunshots. As glass flies everywhere, people are screaming, they're cut. I'm pushing Vader back to the table. Eventually, we get back to the table as the limos arrive on the side. Everybody gets out of the building. Uh, I'm trying to get Vader out. I get him to the limo. The first limo is taken off. I get him into the second limo, and he slams the door and takes off with the limo without me. So now I've got this huge crowd behind me, and they're irate. I mean, they're hurt, there are people screaming, and there's just this one American guy standing behind who's the heel. Uh, terrifying. Owen Hart saw this happen and had his limo driver spin around and pick me up, open the door, and I just dove in, cameras and all, and got out of there. That was, that was Kuwait. That was one of the major stories that happened in Kuwait. There were a lot. That was a crazy trip. Yeah, and you mentioned you mentioned the man there, <clears throat> Owen Hart. Like, and obviously, a lot of people talk about the kind of guy that he was. And unfortunately, you were there the night that he passed away as well. 
and I was reading about the significance of that for you and what you had to do if you want to share it with people because it's very interesting what you had to do kind of in the aftermath of this as well. Sure. That was, we're recording this interview on May 23rd of 2023. Yes, 24 years. Yeah, this is the anniversary of that night uh, in Kansas City. Uh, so Owen was up on the catwalk. Uh, he was in a harness. He had been, he had stepped off the catwalk and was hanging by a rope. The plan was to lower him into the ring. At some point while he was up there just hanging, we were in a tape roll and a release device released and dropped him about 80 feet to the ring. So Owen slammed down in the ring about 20 feet from me. Um, as the night went on, well, we finished the show uh, and then I was asked to go do a, an investigation to go up to the catwalk with the police and photograph the harness and the rigging and everything that happened up there and talk to the rigger and provide Vince McMahon and the lawyers with a briefing on what happened and why it happened. Uh, so that was my night in Kansas City and it was a tough one. Yeah, yeah, obviously the worst night that you've ever had in the business without question. Yeah, yeah, Owen was a, a really good person um, and it was sad to see him die like that. Uh, it was sad to see anybody die like that. We knew that, that the, the production was off the rails. We were heading in that direction. We just didn't know when or how. The specifics were still to be determined. Uh, as Owen was in the ring and they were doing CPR on him, one of our handheld cameramen came up to me and said, I never thought it would be him. Left unsaid was we all knew somebody was going to have that problem. We just didn't know where or when or how. Did you think that it was just kind of going into a dangerous kind of, there's a lot of stunts from jumping off Titan Trons and things like that then, wasn't there? And you just yeah, knew we something were, was going to go wrong. Point. Yeah, we were moving into all of that. We had had several phases of troubles uh, in the production, uh, starting, gosh, I'm thinking 94-ish, probably, WrestleMania. Well, if we go to the, the steroid period, um, we had a show in Bushkill Falls uh, where a truss broke, or a, a span set holding a truss up broke. So we had this long truss that goes across the, the arena held up with two points or two ropes, uh, two chains and motors, and then span sets, which are just nylon rings. One of those span sets broke, the truss dropped, hit a camera platform and a camera and a cameraman, uh, caused a big injury there. About a month later, we had a truss in uh, Liberty, New York, that was being taken out or lifted up in the, the arena, which was really just a high school gym, and it flipped. It flipped 180 degrees as it was going out and dropped equipment down to the floor. Both of those accidents happened pre-show, so there was nobody in the arena other than us, but they told us there was a problem. Then we had an issue at WrestleMania 11 in Hartford, where a long truss, the width of a hockey arena, snapped in the middle as it was being lifted up with two people on it and they were both seriously injured. So we had these three major rigging errors. We addressed that by getting a different rigging company by hiring a company called Bandit Lights, which was top notch in the industry. Uh, and they kind of ship shaped us on a lot of our rigging. Then we had issues with barricades breaking with the stuff being thrown at the ring. Um, this would have been Mid to late 90s, the company was getting into a very edgy product. Uh, people yeah. were jamming against barricades. They were falling over because they had been cut or they were badly rigged or managed. So we were having a lot of injuries in the, the arena. We also had a lot of people throwing things at the arena, at the ring. So we had people being injured that way. And we were intentionally bringing talent in and out of the ring uh, through the crowd. So the crowd would jam around them and push and shove and they'd be pushed and shoved back and there were always injuries there. So we had these three things happening in, in waves or stages. And then we got into production uh, stunts like the Owen Hart stunt. There had been others too. Uh, we didn't have a stunt coordinator. We were just flying by the seat of our pants. And it was very clear that at one point something was gonna go very wrong. Yeah. Yeah. And did I read right that you had to like explain to Vince McMahon in the aftermath of this, how would it have happened with your photos? 
Yeah. So I did the uh, initial investigation with Owen that night, went up to the catwalks, took all the pictures, um, went to the police lab with the police, with the ID officers and shot the harness. Uh, and then that night drove halfway to the next town, which was Kansas City. I think we were going to St. Louis. Stopped at a marina the next morning and bought har hardware that was similar to what was used in the stunt. Went to the next arena. Vince was looking for me as soon as I arrived. I'd go in to explain to him what had happened. He didn't want to look at the hardware. Uh, we were getting pictures processed, so that was at the lab. He didn't want to see any pictures. He just wanted to know what happened, what went wrong, what did you see? Uh, so I had to give him a quick briefing on that. And then I was pulled into a phone call with our lawyers. And then the pictures came back, and that was that. Yeah, that's absolutely it's just it was just i'll never forget it like i was very very young at the time i was only 10 but I, at at that age and at that time i was kind of like is this you know because you're kind of is this part of the show like and then yeah yeah i've you know, heard from a lot of people that were that age that were 10 12 yeah. 14 for whom this was a pivotal moment in their lives because it's when they confronted yeah. death really for the first time yeah because then when I started to realize that this was real, I guess, is when I seen it, even in the newspapers over here, because there'd never be pro wrestling in the newspapers in Ireland, just wasn't a thing. And that's when it kind of processed home for me. But anyway, we'll go on. We'll bring back the mood up again. We'll, let's talk about the divas. The divas. And you, yes, you photo shoot, and you mentioned before as well that Sonny was probably the most influential female that you have photographed in terms of what she done for the business so yeah influential uh, is a really good know? word yeah, yeah good good way to put that one influential um that took us back to the the time of um when the company was in trouble we were struggling expenses were yeah. cut my travel budget was cut my equipment budget was cut i was really bored sunny was a valet to chris candido uh, they played yeah. as sunny and skip um she was unhappy with that and really wanted something more. So she talked to me and we figured out that we could do a shoot together, uh, kind of a, enhance her character or her role as a, as a beauty. Um, it was a role that didn't exist yet. We were just looking for pinup kind of pictures. So I went to Rochester, New York. We set up a studio backstage. And before the show, we took Sonny outside and I just shot a couple of pictures of her, a roll or two of film under this beautiful orange light in various outfits, looking sexy. Uh, they were different. It's unlike anything we had ever done at World Wrestling. At the time, we had just started with America Online. They had a tremendous demand for content, and we could put anything we wanted up there. So we threw these sunny pictures up for America Online. They hit painter, the huge downloads, huge connect time. We made money when people connected with our product. So Vince McMahon saw that. He saw the downloads, uh, he saw the connect hours, and he decided to promote them a little bit more. So he took Sonny into his house in Greenwich, Connecticut, and did a series of shoots with her, a series of vignettes. Um, I was there for that, shooting still pictures. Between their television productions, uh, I did some coaching with Sonny and made some still pictures of my own. Vince saw the way I worked with Sonny and had me produce a couple of TV spots down in Miami Beach, and that was the start of the Divas. Do you think, um, I know it, it kind of changed over the years, but do you think that they kind of maybe went too far at times with stuff that they'd done into the early 2000s? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Um, hot, Divas. Hot, hot lesbian action and Mae Young giving a, birth to a hand, that's kind of different, but you know, that kind of stuff. Was there ever anything that you thought was too much? Um, yeah, there were a couple things that I saw that were more than we wanted, more than I thought we should be doing. Uh, there was a spot with Jake Roberts and, um, Rick Rude, uh, ravishing Rick Rude. They were doing a, a match and Cheryl, Jake's wife was a part of that. Uh, we did this spot in Chicago, uh, where Jake would lose, uh, Cheryl was required, I think, to kiss, um, ravishing Rick Rude, and she didn't want to do that. So Rick got her down on the mat and did this dancing thing over her as he bent down and forced a kiss on her in the middle of the ring at the end of the show. It, 
it, it was pushing limits for us, for anybody. We thought there would be a good crowd pop. There wasn't. The crowd was aghast at what they were seeing. It was effectively a, a rape in the ring. Um, even long before Me Too, that was thought to be, the, the crowd was not buying that. So I went back and talked, they told the agents what I saw and why I thought that was bad. Uh, and I don't think we did it again. I think that was, we had to kind of trim that one back a bunch. So that was one thing. Um, the whole gold dust at it, angle uh the back lot brawl that bothered me a lot i thought that was too much gay bashing and too aggressive uh, even for that day um the gold dust was playing a character that was he, it was a gay character although they were claiming it wasn't um he was offending people and wreaking havoc and it really mischaracterized that part of our population a lot of people were very upset about that I had been through a production meeting back in Stanford with our art directors and art crew, and they were really angry about it and really wanted Vince to know that. Uh, I said that I'd see if I could talk to Vince, and I did. Uh, found him backstage at a TV event at one point, said, this is really bothering me, and this is why, and I'm hearing it from a lot of other people, including our staff back in Stanford. And he told me not to worry about it that they had this, this angle worked out and I would really like the finish. Well, the finish was Rowdy Roddy Piper beating the snot out of gold dust, which was exactly the wrong way to end that one. Um, it was gay bashing at the extreme level. Yeah. So yeah, that's another one that I didn't like at all. Yeah. Any memories of working with The Undertaker? I'm assuming you had to do countless shoots for him, most likely studios. Yeah, I don't, right? have, yeah, I don't have any major kind of stories about The Undertaker. I liked working with him a lot. He was very, very easy to work with uh, as long as he had time to come into the studio. Uh, his character lent itself to all kinds of different lighting and, and, and shoot options. So he was fun to shoot because I could do anything with him. I could be creative. Uh, so I made lots of really good pictures of him and he appreciated that. Uh, so good man to work with. Yeah. And obviously another guy that came in, like. A lot of people don't have many stories about this guy, Glenn Jacobs, Kane. What, what's he like? <laughs> um, I liked him a lot. Uh, yeah. I did one shoot with him as a talent, which was weird. It went on television once and then disappeared. I've never actually seen it. When he was doing his um, Isaac Yankum piece, so he was being introduced as Dr. Isaac, Isaac Yankum, DDS, a, a dentist. Uh, we did a series yeah. of, of vignettes at a dentist's office where he was yanking people's teeth. And I happened to be there and we needed a person to fill in the chair. So I got stuck in the chair and he simulated yanking my teeth and I had to scream and be in pain. And it ran once, Linda McMahon thought it was too much pain, that it, it wouldn't work as a repeat, so it never aired again. That was my one story with, with Isaac Yankum, with Glenn Jacobs. He was a good man. And, yeah. There might be footage of it somewhere. There is someplace. It, it aired once, so it has to exist someplace. Uh, there were several yeah. other vignettes. Um, Michelle Carlucci, one of our backstage people, uh, was in another one, and that still airs every once in a while. That's still on their their site. Yeah, I'm gonna pluck random things out at you now. Uh, any memories of WrestleMania 14 when Mike Tyson was around? Um, not a smart guy. <laughs> That's what I'll say about Mike Tyson. Um, we did a press conference in New York City to announce this match. I think it was probably yeah. Shawn Michaels and uh, Stone Cold. Is that right? Yeah. You know? All right. Yeah. So we have a dais, and Tyson is in the middle, and Shawn and, and Stone Cold are on either end. And what's supposed to happen is Shawn and Diesel, or Shawn and uh, Stone Cold, are supposed to approach each other in the middle with anger and stare face to face mm. and then tyson is supposed to get his hands and hold them apart so that's the shot push them back mm. yeah push them back and it's there's still photographers there and we've just set this thing up so they get an easy picture that will tell the story well tyson gets up and he turns around backwards and somebody else in the, the media has to say mike turn around not a smart guy <laughs> so i think he was originally scheduled to be an in-ring referee special guest referee but it became clear to us that he just didn't have that capacity. So he became a, an outside the ring guest enforcer. Uh, 
and it worked that way. Yeah. Yeah. He was an, yeah. a nice guy. I don't have any issues there. He just wasn't real smart. Um, as we were in that, we were in a restaurant setting this thing up. It was like a hard rock kind of place. Um, there are all these pictures on the wall of famous places and people and, and whatnot. Uh, and I tried to engage Mike in a conversation about something that he was looking at on the wall. And it just, it, it was hard. <laughs> he, he was not a conversational kind of guy. Okay. Okay. Um, any memories of anyone getting badly hurt in the ring or any kind of stories along that line? Boy, there were a lot of injuries. Um, in Tampa, Florida, we had a, an extra uh, who was hurt in a match with, I think, the Rockers, broke his back. Uh, for that one, I was in the back of the ring when I saw that happen, and it was instant. He knew it right away that he's broken his back, he's paralyzed, and he got medevaced out. Um, the issue there was we were hiring people who had no training or experience or very little training and experience. Uh, and as a result of that, we developed a better way of recruiting our extras. And made sure that they had training and experience and they had interaction with the talent before the match happened uh, and then i was at ringside when draws was hurt uh, he broke his neck oh yeah um that one it was delo brown and it was a pile driver i think right in the corner i was probably yeah. two or three feet from that action when it happened and saw it instantly the the way the body interacts or the way the body responds to a broken neck, it just goes limp. And it was obvious right from before he was even dropped that it was bad. Uh, so that was a horrible accident. Uh, and I was at ringside on the announce side when Triple H blew out his uh, the quad, his quad, um, and actually saw it roll up inside his leg. And yet he continued the match. That was crazy. Uh, I don't know how he did that. It had to hurt so much. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and there were lots of other injuries, all kinds of injuries along the way. What was the evolution of Triple H like before your exit? Because I know, you know, obviously he was with Stephanie near that time. And could you see him kind of coming into more of a hands-on role even at that point? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. He was the McMahon's favorite. You could see that very clearly. Uh, and he was Stephanie's. I don't know if they were married at that point yet. I don't remember when that happened. Um, but there was definitely a relationship there. And he, he was also a smart promoter. Uh, he understood the business and he understood, understood storytelling. So he's a good man in that regard too. So it wasn't entirely undeserved. Um, and he grew into the spot. Yeah. Do you remember, cause you talked about the struggling time for the business in the nineties with the steroids, but obviously the Monday night wars was a big thing that people from my era of watching wrestling will remember um was there ever any kind of worry in the business at that time about wcw beating them all those times or sure. was it just sure. something they felt was going to blow over no no we were concerned for our, our company and our jobs and, and the business um wcw was fronted by uh or backed by ted turner who had billions and billions of dollars in infinite pockets he could ride this thing yeah. as hard and long as he wanted and just buy out any talent he wanted and whatever TV time he wanted. Uh, this was a, an opponent that we couldn't fight directly uh, point to point. We had to find another way and creativity was the way to do that. Um, we knew that only one of the two companies would survive. Uh, and we were certainly hoping it would be us. And ultimately it was, uh, I think Ted Turner just plain lost interest. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, did you ever get to work with The Rock much? Oh, I worked with him all the time, yeah. Um, probably my favorite talent of all, like through the entire 16 or 17 years I was there. Uh, first met The Rock when he was training, so he hadn't worked with us at all yet. Uh, I had a, a studio in the television building, a still photo studio in the back of a warehouse space, and right in front of that we had a ring, and the talent would work out in that ring. So Rock was one of the guys that was training there, and he had a heck of a work ethic, uh, working really, really hard. And you could see that right from the beginning before he ever stepped in the foot, stepped the foot in our ring. Uh, and then he grew, and he just became incredibly creative. Uh, when a show was over, a television show was over, we had to strike the arena, strike all the equipment. Usually the match 
ended, the TV show ended, but then we'd have something else for the crowd going on to keep them happy or make them happy as they blew out. The crew wasn't interested in any of that. As soon as the show went off the air, we'd start stripping cables and picking up equipment and packing everything in. When a guy like The Rock was in the ring or Stone Cold Steve Austin or Mick Foley, the crew stayed put. We weren't necessarily shooting at all, but we were watching because it was so entertaining. So that was The Rock. He was able to cut through all of that clutter and impress people that saw this every day, year after year. So yeah, real good guy. After all the, the years of being around in this business, and I know like you weren't a fan coming into it, did you end up becoming invested in the product or did you still see it as work? Oh, no. The, the, any job I'm in, uh, I, I become invested in it. Uh, and I see more than just my job. Um, and that was certainly true there. Uh, and I care a lot about the people that were doing that job. Um, I respected the heck out of them and enjoy the creative storytelling. So yeah, I was I was focused on that and very into it. Uh, left the company and that all went away. I don't watch wrestling anymore. Uh, I'm not really aware of what's going on, although I still kind of follow the news with wrestling. Yeah, yeah. What's the most important thing you learned in the WWF? Storytelling. Um, good guy, bad guy, conflict, conflict resolution. Um, a good guy and bad guy don't do anything and a conflict doesn't do anything. That doesn't sell tickets. What sells tickets is the potential for a resolution and then ultimately a resolution, a payoff of some kind. So in terms of storytelling, that's what I learned about the payoff. How do you, how do you target this thing? How do you build it to a payoff? Mm -hmm. Let's change it up a bit now and let's talk about day-to-day -day life for you. But before we go into what, what you actually do, Let's talk about the kind of stuff that you put on Facebook for people that mightn't be aware, because like there is so much good stuff there that people like could spend like hours reading about and like everything from timetables to lanyards to merchandise to you. You kept so much. I did. I did. Um, I kept all the magazines from the time that I was there uh, and I kept all a lot of paperwork. Um, so when I finished with a month of work, uh, I'd pull everything out of my notebook and a lot of that would be shoved into folders and saved just for tax purposes or where was I and what was happening at that point. So I saved a lot of that material and I saved a lot of memorabilia kind of stuff, just put it in boxes. And when I left the company, all those boxes went into my mom's basement and they just stayed there for 20 years. Uh, she just moved into a, an assisted living home and all those boxes had to come out. She was selling her house. So I opened them up and found all these memories and started sharing them on Facebook. Um, so I've, I've had a lot of stuff. If you look at my Facebook feed, you'll find a lot of wrestling stories, but stories about other things too. Uh, and if you look at the photos part, you'll find three archives of photos of me and wrestlers with little stories about them. So there was a, a huge batch of material around July through probably August, September of 2022, as I was opening up these boxes of, of archive material and just telling stories about what I was seeing and, and what was happening at those times. And then this year, 2023, probably February through March timeframe, uh, I pulled out the folders that I had and ran through the schedules, the calendars of events year by year and told stories about what was happening in those years. So for people that are interested in that sort of stuff, you just cruise through my Facebook feed. You'll find all of that. Yeah. What was your favorite moment? If you could pick one of the, the 17 years being there, if you could pick one night in the WWF, what was it? Probably WrestleMania three, because it was so big. And from my perspective, so unexpected. Um, and I was suddenly, in, I realized I was in the middle of pop culture extraordinaire. So that would probably be the biggest night, the biggest event. Yeah. And you'll, you'll hear about that from our good friend, Keith Elliott Greenberg, when he writes his WrestleMania tree book, just a nice little plug for him there as well. There you go. <laughs> yeah. It should be an interesting book. He's talking to a lot of different people that were there. Uh, and he's talking about what actually happened in the event and how it fit into the, the story of the WWF at the time and even now. 
So that was a pivotal event in the company's history as it finally grew and broke through into a whole new uncharted territory. And Keith is writing about that whole experience. Yeah. So tell us about your, you're not in the photography game anymore. You're doing something totally different when you're doing two, two different things. Do you want to tell us about them? Sure. Uh, in the wintertime, I teach snowboarding and a little bit of skiing. So I do that at Okemo Mountain Resort. I've been doing that for about 22 years. Uh, in the summertime, I teach and guide fly fishing for the Orvis Company. They're the leaders in fly fishing in the United States. Uh, so those are my two seasonal jobs. For about 25 years, I taught skydiving. So that was another thing that I was engaged in, uh, even while I was with World Wrestling. Mm. They, if they called you tomorrow and said, Tom, we need you to photograph an event, would you do it? <laughs> no. Um, I have no. no idea what they're doing now. Um, I'm not the right person for that now anyway. I haven't picked up a real camera in 20 years, so they wouldn't ask for that kind of help, uh, and I wouldn't want, to, wouldn't want to be there for it. Why, why did you decide to put the lens down then, ultimately? Um, it was a great career. I was a photojournalist from high school all the way through college and then for six years after that, and then about 16 years with World Wrestling total. Uh, so it was a good 20 to 25 year career. Um, I think I did everything I wanted to do. When I left, I was looking for other photography jobs and they were just boring. Uh, shoot catalogs here or shoot marketing for a college there. And how do you step from World Wrestling Entertainment into something like that? There really isn't a way to follow up. Um, the camera gear I owned or used at that point was all owned by the company. Uh, when I left, they kept the cameras. So it was at a point where I would have to buy equipment. Digital photography was just starting really. So it would have been a very, very expensive investment. And I wasn't enjoying it so much. Uh, by the end of my time with World Wrestling, I was spending about a third of my time shooting probably and two thirds of my time managing. So it was good career. It was time to, to call it quits. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty. It's pretty full on. I don't think people realize uh, the amount of work that goes into something like that. You know, when you're talking to people and you tell them that you work in some kind of media, they they don't think it's a real job. Have you got that? <laughs> well, they say that about my snowboard instructing and fly fishing instructing too. Um, they're they're good jobs, but they're jobs. Yeah, I, I don't have. It's only. It's only, it's only jealousy. That's all. Yeah, there's some of that too. Yeah. It, Tom. I'd like to thank you for the conversation today. I really, really enjoyed it. And um, I wish you all the best with everything. And I'll keep oh, in contact you. with you. Okay. Thank you very much. I hope the fans enjoy hearing the stories and uh, and keep, keep watching, I guess. I'm sure they will, Tom.